at this time, allow me to invite uh, Madam Susan Maua to give us the presentation on the framework. Karibu, Susan. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I would also want to recognize those who are online. Thank you for joining us. That is the advantage that we've had with the COVID that it's one benefit that came out of it that we, are, we have embraced the online uh, way of doing things. So wherever you are, feel most welcome and you can use the chat if you have any comments or questions. So I will take you through the, <clears throat> the framework for community engagement in management of alcohol and drug abuse. And this is informed by, first of all, the goal, the sustainable development goal that we are responding to is 3.5, goal number three, that is good health and well-being, and specifically 3.5, which is to strengthen the prevention and treatment of substance abuse, including narcotic drug abuse and harmful use of alcohol. And you may be aware that last year, we developed the national guidelines on alcohol and drug use prevention. A lot has been done in treatment and prevention has been lagging behind. So from that document, part of the things that we needed to do is to look at the various settings because prevention is actually done in settings so that we have those who work with families, there are those who work in schools, we have the workplace, we have media and we have community. So you find that specifically this document is giving a lot of reference to the setting of the community where you are coming from. So there are many benefits to working at the community level because we have policies in place. And so those who work in the community should help in enforcing of <clears throat> laws. For example, we have the alcohol and tobacco policies that needs to be um, implemented and therefore those who work in the community go a long way in helping in advocacy and also, um, you know, just taking part in that. So uh, one of the benefits or Protective factors for the community include the higher cost of alcohol and tobacco products. And you know that anytime uh, there is, it's called the syntax. That is where most of the increases in taxes usually go. Then we have regulation of the outlet density of shops selling alcohol. You know that that is a big challenge right now in our country. And it is those who work in the community who need to advocate for this. The Alcoholic Drinks Control Act actually provides that community members also have a voice when it comes to even the places where those um, outlets should be. So that would be a protective factor. Illicit drugs, prevention of sale of illicit drugs and then enforcing the existing laws in alcohol is also a protective factor that as those who work in the community will play a big role in helping in enforcement and also ensuring that we have drug-free entertainment um, environments, especially right now that children are back home for an extended period you know that entertainment venues are going to be one area that parents would like to take their children. So why do we have this document? We are recognizing that those who work in the community need to come together and form work groups. So if you come together, it means that you need to bring on board businesses, parents, the media, the law enforcement, learning institutions, 
faith-based organizations, those in healthcare, the service, social service and government, all these people, when we come together, will be able to have a better environment. And again, when those who work in community come together, we'll create changes that will reduce the social, economic and health consequences of drug use in our community. And so there are other additional benefits, like when we work together, we will also achieve a wider reach within a community compared to if as one civil society organization, you work alone, there's a wider reach. You will also accomplish the objectives beyond the scope of your own organization. So the organizations represented here and even online, you know that you have your specific objectives, but when you work together, you will go beyond that. There is also greater credibility than when you are uh, one organization. And later on, we are going to see what are, what are additional benefits if you are going to work together, particularly when it comes to uh, funding. It also provides a forum for sharing information and providing a range of advice and perspectives, even to NACADA as the specialized agency. So you matter to us, and that is why uh, we recognize you and we know that when you provide the different perspectives, especially what is on the ground, it goes a long way to create um, a, a safe environment. Again, when you foster cooperation between organizations, it means that even community members are going to benefit and not wonder what is happening and who can, where they can get the help in their organizations. Again, you will find that by bringing, coming together, there is also increased involvement of community members because community members do not know that in the law, they have a role to play to create safe environments for children and also leveraging on available resources and also uh, quality on program delivery. So what is the objective, um, the goal of this particular document and also the objectives? One, we want to anchor the initiatives, all those things that we are doing within the community so that we create safer, healthier and substance use free communities across Kenya. It is possible if we come together. And so I know that all of us aim to reduce alcohol and drug use in the community. We also work towards, in this case, we need to work towards leveraging joint initiatives and resources. For example, you know that uh, with devolution, the function of um, licensing of alcohol went to the counties. But within that law or the laws in the counties, they are also supposed to fund civil society organizations. But you see, it can only happen if we work together and speak with one voice. So we can also leverage on initiatives and resources and also standardize and harmonize community efforts so that together we can bring down uh, the prevalence of alcohol and drug abuse. Some of the activities that you could be doing when you come together is to advocate and lobby for implementation of the policies that are there, the alcohol policy, the tobacco policy, and even the narcotics. Those, all those, it's cause for lobbying. And it is the civil society organizations particularly that can help in this. We also have uh, support of mapping stakeholders who within uh, the community where you work, who else is there so that you can bring together all the stakeholders and together from the work groups. And also pre provide an action plan for engagements among stakeholders so that there is transparency and inclusivity. So that again, we are not in competition. There is also um, stakeholder engagement so that the document is also clarifying how you can engage with others. It also provides on how you handle grievances because when we come together, 
coming from different organizations, if we come together, we are also likely to have um, some conflicts. So how do we handle this? And it's also very important that monitoring, evaluation, and reporting procedures is included because continuous learning and improvement in this field is very critical. So it applies to all the people who work in prevention and management of alcohol and drug abuse at the community level. So communities or civil society organizations and other, um, including government, government institutions that are there so that we can work together and create uh, that safe environment. So here, the document also provides you with the principles of community engagement. And one of them is clarity of purpose. It needs to be very clear. If we come together as different organizations, what is going to be our common purpose? So that if you are going to lobby, it only works if you're speaking the same voice. Understand the target community because we don't have a one size fits all. So it's very good that you understand the community where you work, you know, who is there, what are their, perspe uh, their perspectives with regard to um, engaging, what are the problems that they need to sort out in that community. So it's very important that you understand. The other is collaboration and partnerships. So we are encouraging uh, this collaboration because it is very key for our um, working together in the community. Collective self-determination, we are also recognizing that every community has the power to make decisions. They know what is best for themselves. They may not have an idea how to do it, but they are very clear about it. So trusting that even the community where you work, they know what is best for them is it's very key. And then diversity and inclusion so that we do not just target certain groups of people but leave out the others. So that inclusivity is very important. So we are talking about the multicultural awareness, we are talking about the vulnerable populations, those who are marginalized. We also have those ones that are hard to reach, like those who work in um, the slum areas, you know better, you are the ones who may reach them. We could also have people with drug use. The ones who use drugs, you know, are already hard to reach groups. And therefore, the other principle is resource mobilization. How can we come together so that we can leverage on assets, on networks and capacities so that we can have collective decision making? So this document also provides you with the steps towards um, creating a work group, because that is what you are encouraging, that we need to work together. So the first one is you need to define the problem and its impact in the community. As NACADA, we do surveys, national surveys, which, uh, you know, it is it samples across the country. But now in the community where you are, where you are working, what is the problem? So we need to uh, define the problem and its impact in that community. So that includes the surveys that have been done, but it also includes the perspectives of the people in that community. So those are some of the questions you should ask yourself. Then there are the key stakeholders. Who are the key stakeholders in the community where you work? So that is also very key so that you involve them. It includes opinion leaders, people of influence in that community. We also have Nyumbakumi. We know there are areas where Nyumbakumi is working very well. We have the residents associations. So all those are part of the stakeholders. So who is the stakeholder in that community? The other <clears throat> that we need to look at, hmm. this thing is stuck. All right, the third one is formation of a steering committee, because if you are coming together, it means it becomes important that 
uh, you have a committee that is going to steer the process. So identifying organizations within your setting or within the community where you work. And when you look at the document, you see the definition of community. So that then it's a very broad term, but um, it helps you identify whether it is within a region or it is in a, a sub county or you know in a ward all those are going to be um, different levels of community so which organizations are already working there and how can you come together so that you end up with a community a committee that can drive the process there so once you have this the next thing is to divide and set preliminary objectives and activities for the work group what do you want to do jointly as a community so the other is to have the work group and because we have regional offices when um, it comes to creating the work groups then it means that we'll work collaboratively collaboratively with the um with our regional offices that will have help to drive the agenda in the beginning but once you pick up then they should be able to work on their own. So just recognizing that when you have um, resources that are within the community, the church, educational centers, the social halls, the schools, so that you don't think in terms of, oh, we do not have funding to come to a place like KICD, but we have other places within the community where we can convene the work group. So it also tells you what is it that you are going to do uh, to convene that. Then discussing the current uh, local reality and the ideal situation the community desires. Because sometimes the survey shows this, this particular substance is what is most prevalent. But from the community, when they use their own eyes, what we call gut reaction, by their gut reaction, they feel that this is, this is the situation. So how do you... Um, reconcile the statistics from the research and the community's perception. So that is what we mean by the current local reality and the ideal situation. Because if there is going to be a change in the community, then they need to recognize. And even you who works in that community needs to recognize the efforts and what will work for them. And then a vision for that community. What would that community want? What change would they want to see? And therefore, it helps to come up with a vision. Then determining the next sustainable steps, because remember, we want to leverage on existing programs. We want to mobilize for resources. We want to develop interventions. We want to advocate for change and also influence policy development and review. And I want to recognize that we already have some of the civil society organizations that are actively engaging with county governments to influence policy change as they can see within their community. So the other thing is capacity development. We recognize that as we move towards what is evidence-based, it becomes important that we build capacity. So um it's going to be important that those work groups once they are created should also undertake continuous capacity assessment and as nakada we are also committing to do that we've we've actually even started there is one group that is already undergoing the um universal prevention curriculum core which is the introduction so we will work towards this capacity building so not just for the steering committee, but subcommittees, depending on what that region will decide on. So we are talking about building skills on advocacy, in lobbying, research, communication, comprehensive strategies, cultural knowledge, interpersonal skills, um, resource mobilization, and so on. Remember, I've just mentioned that in our existing laws, we already have those in place, but it's because uh, many organizations are not aware that those resources are available and therefore they are not able to harness the resources. So in capacity, 
uh, development, there is also a need to do outreach. So there is providing information. And so as we get into capacity building, we are going to see how do we work on this. Enhancing skills. And that can be done in workshops, seminars, whether it is, it is virtual, it is in person. So you can see the various ways that we can do that. Like I've mentioned, we've already started this process. And so we would encourage you to um, join us and also let others know that when these uh, capacity building um, opportunities are there, then they can take advantage of it. And then providing support for people who uh, participate in activities because we are focusing on reducing the risks as we enhance protection. So what are, the, what are the services that are there? So you can see some of them, including referrals to treatment and rehabilitation centers, and some of you are represented here, support groups, the youth clubs, the parenting groups, the Alcoholics and Narcotics Anonymous, all those are part of uh, support that is available. And, and people don't know about them. So this will be opportunities to enhance that. We can also reduce barriers and enhance access, not just to treatment, but also other programs that are there and also change consequences so that again, we enhance the protective factors as we reduce the risk factors because that essentially is very important. So even um, recognizing the changes that are there within our community. And um, as Nakada, we've periodically done this when we have the International Day Against uh, Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking, we usually recognize. So it would be very good if this information is coming from the work groups. Then there is a change in physical design. I know some of you have had complaints about even um, abandoned buildings being areas where drug use um, actually happens or even crime. Then advocating for review and implementation of policies. You've already mentioned that. And therefore civil society organizations play a very key role in doing this. Now, lastly, we are talking about ethical considerations. The document also tells you about even in prevention, you can do harm. And therefore, because we are talking about prevention and management, then we need to recognize there could be conflict of interest because you shall not cooperate in corporate members who in any way have vested interests in alcohol and drug use. And that means industry. Industry cannot be part of the work groups. So that is what we mean there by conflict of interest. Competence, we know that as um, director had mentioned earlier, we've been having quite a bit of quirks. So now is the time to make things right by building competence and competence means training, it is skills, it is uh, experience, the knowledge so that you can apply. And that is why we are saying that capacity building, not just for prevention, but we have for treatment, recovery coaching, there are many opportunities for capacity building. Confidentiality is something that must be observed at all times while handling participants and even the information they provide. Because sometimes part of what they could provide is who is trafficking, yeah? Because they, have, they are part of your program and they find that um, supply is a problem in their area. So if drugs are available and they are able to give uh, probably even names or indications of what is happening. That means that information must be kept confidential. And also informed consent when we have participants in our uh, programs, then it's important that they uh, have informed consent, including where we have children like in schools, because the parents need to know that their children are participating in a given program. Again, you shall not do harm. You shall not do harm. And therefore, that it's very important that we refrain from taking actions that may harm others. And we've, we've had reports 
about people who do that to cause harm. We are talking about tailoring our interventions. We don't have a one size fits all in prevention. And I'm sure even in treatment, we do not have that. So we are talking about tailoring our interventions so that we address our audience depending on their characteristics, that is the age, the gender, the ethnicity, and so on. We do not have a one size fits all. And if you go to our website, you'll find we've already developed some of the materials which are age specific and respect is very important. The community's rights, even with the cultural context, sometimes the things that we still hold dearly may be in conflict. So how do we um, respect the rights of the community autonomy and even dignity. And it is very important that we provide truthful information about what we are doing so that we avoid misleading or misrepresenting ourselves as work groups and as people who work in communities. So in monitoring, we are also in the process of developing a national alcohol and drug use prevention system so it means that as we speak today, we do not know what many institutions are doing, but now we are coming up with a monitoring and evaluation system that then collectively we will also be reporting into this system so that we are able to even account for what we are doing. And you know, that also comes with, if you are going to make a case for funding, and there are great opportunities for civil society organizations when it comes to funding, even internationally. There are many um, institutions that are ready to fund civil society organizations. So when you work with government or you work, you are collectively um, involved as a work group, then it means it also increases your chances and it gives credibility to the work that you do. So it is important that once we get to uh, the prevention system, we hope that by 2023 we'll have it, then again, we will invite you so that you also make a contribution to it. So thank you so much. And our helpline works 24 hours and it's available for everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Susan, for taking us through the highlights of the framework. To the ones who just joined us, feel welcome. I hope you have uh, greeted the person next to you. So allow me to recognize the institutions that are represented here. So when I call an institution, kindly just a wave at us so that if you want to network with you later, we can reach out to you. So we have ISAP Kenya. Hi, South Kenya. Uh, we have Slum Child Foundation. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We have SAPTA. Okay, thank you. We have Evangelical Alliance of Kenya. Uh, Karibuni Sana. We have Non Communicable Diseases Alliance of Kenya. We have Ministry of Education, that is basic education. We have Kenya Alliance of Resident Association. We have Blue Cross Kisumu. All the way from the left side, Karibu Sana. We have Renaissance Kisumu. Karibu Sana. We have Kadke represented, uh, Karibu Sana. And we have SCAD. Karibu Sana. Uh, thank you so much, members. Now, at this point, allow me to invite uh, one of our stakeholders to give us remarks on behalf of the CSOs and other stakeholders. 
So allow me to invite Professor Catherine Vishuga, who is the president of Kenya Counselors and Psychologists Association. Welcome, Your Excellency. Invited guests, the CEO Nakada, the senior management of Nakada, the staffs of Nakada, and representatives of partner organizations and agencies to Nakada. Good morning. The launch of this framework, that is the framework for community engagement in the management of alcohol and drug abuse is indeed a milestone for the civil society organizations. And for NACADA as the regulator, the coordinator and facilitator of the efforts to deal with demand reduction. This is a new dawn and we are delighted about it. And we all need to read the document and capacity build our staffs, our people that we are working with in the CSOs so that they can appreciate how to use the document. I am the current chair of Community Anti-Drugs Coalitions of Kenya, and we work within communities establishing outfits comprising of community sectors. Such community sectors include CSOs and also education, people from education, we put them in, uh, people from media, religious institutions, legal organs, local administration, the youth, the women groups, the business community, etc. So that we can be able to combat this enemy that keeps on harming our own people, our own children, our youth, and even the elder, the elders within communities. We make sure that um, our community interventions, we engage the people within those communities. And we have 11 communities. We have Georgia in Kiabu, we have Kadara in Moranga, we have three in Nairobi, that is Kibla, Madare, and Kasarani. We have Kajiado in Kajiado, and we have Maridi in Kilifi, and we have two in Mobasa, that is Likoni and Vita, and two in Kware, that is Musabweni and Matuga. And we are happy because of the work that we've been able to do this farm and we utilize comprehensive strategies to carry out our work. And also we utilize SAMHSA's framework in interventions which entail community assessment. We do community assessment that, like it is detailed in the framework. We also do the planning and prioritization. We do the implementation but we also make sure that we are respecting the cultures of the people that we are working with. And at the same time, we ensure sustainability. We focus on drugs used in a particular locality, just like Susan has said, that the drugs that are used all over the country may not be the same ones that are being used in a particular community, a particular locality. And that is the reason as to why assessment is very critical. 
We look at issues of access and availability within a community and also the risk factors and local conditions which are drivers of the problem. But we also make sure that the interventions are comprehensive, they are quite a wide range so that they can be able to impact on the community. We didn't have a government structure to anchor on. And hence, we are excited at having a framework which informs us on how to pull resources together and synergy to have more assured results, whether it is singularly or even collectively as organizations. I am also the chairperson, as director has said, of Kenya Counseling and Psychologists Association. And our affiliate institutions are going to benefit from the framework to enhance the partnerships and pooling of resources to fight against a common th threat to health, economy, family life, education, society, institutions, and also our progress. As such, this framework is going to inform on working structures and processes and also outputs. We as Kenya Counseling and Psychological Associations are going to seek a more formalized engagement with NACADA to ensure our counselors and psychologists that work in communities, whether they are working singularly or they are working within organizations or agencies, that they are going to be working using the policies and also the guidelines and also the curricula that is developed internationally so that we can be able to do that which is standardized at the international level and also at national level. I want to thank you, all of you, for taking your time and interest so that you can come for us to be able to launch this particular document that is giving us a framework on how we are going to be engaging with each other in combating drug abuse within our community. This is a very important resource that all of us need to take. Questions. But just like I said, we have so many policies and guidelines that are developed. And unless we take our people through to understand how they can be able to utilize those policies and those guidelines and those standards, then they can remain in the shelves without being utilized. So we pray that uh, you're going to do that so that we can utilize this particular resource. So I really appreciate the invite and also the resource that we are going to be using as card care and also institutions and organizations at the Kenya Counseling and Psychological Association. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. So at this juncture, it is my privilege to invite our CEO, Mr. Victor Okioma, to officially welcome us to the launch and give his remarks. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tari. Uh, this function, I think, was, uh, was scheduled at a time when people are already in the festival season and their mood. 
And uh, that explains their participation. Uh, I think uh, people have already decided they are leave their holiday. Uh, nevertheless, uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome those of you who found time to join us this morning as we as we launch this uh, this framework. Uh, from where I sit, the launch of this framework is a demonstration of our, of our commitment as the authority uh, to extend our footprints to the community and to have something that helps us to, uh, uh, to kind of engage. Uh, the war against uh, drug and substance abuse in this country is a huge one, and it requires the participation of which and every Kenyan. Uh, and therefore, to be able to have an, a formula for engaging the communities that we wish to engage, I think this document will go a long way in guiding us uh, on how we need to engage and how we need to uh, work together with those many of you who are here uh, represented in the communities and therefore we really need to look for a way of uh, working more closely because of these guidelines. I know that uh, uh, like uh, prof has, uh, that through capital they have already gone ahead of us by creating these uh, structures within the community but we need to build on that uh, she has actually mentioned where they already have uh, established coalitions uh, and i must uh, be honest about it uh, they have uh, a working structure within the community where the community is given an opportunity to discuss their own problems where the community is allowed to come up with ideas on how to address their own drug related issues and that to me this is building on the effort of some of you who are already here and going forward i want to advise that uh, <laughs> We go back, you know, sometimes ago we did the mapping of all the stakeholders in this space. And we have a book that tells uh, details uh, who is who out there in the, uh, on the ground. And therefore, this framework needs to first of all tap to those organizations that we had already identified through another process uh, so that. Um, we are able to put them on board as those work groups because they are already existing. They are either charge based, they are, they are, they are either NGOs or faith based or community based organizations. They are already having some structure. So let us look into those uh, uh, community structures and we can really define them as our work groups and then agree on how we can work together closely uh, in order to realize the objectives of this framework. And I want to commit myself that uh, we will, as an authority, put in some money to try and the capacity build some of those organizations that we will have identified as being active and being uh, focused on the issues around uh, drug and substance abuse in the country. Uh, finally, I just want to indicate to you that uh, from the authority and the representative of the chair is here, we'll talk about it. We are very deliberate on our engaging the community because we have already the blessings from the board that we need to engage in partnerships. We need to engage in work groups. We need to engage in the organizations that are already within the community so that we can be able to put our footprint across the country. Otherwise, on our own, we cannot make it. And we realize that we can only achieve 
our feasibility can only be achieved within the community by working through this framework and by identifying as many of those organizations that are operating within the community so that they are part of our infrastructure for the fight against drug and substance abuse in the country. That's the only way out and I don't see any other way. I think lastly, let me wish you a Merry Christmas and a blessed new year. Thank you very much. I'm instructed that I now should invite the representative of uh, uh, the chair, who is uh, Dr. Ogola, to come and uh, address us. Dr. Ogola is a very active member of our board, and more importantly, he comes from the faith-based space. So he, he has a lot of insights around these issues. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you, CEO. Uh, good morning. As has been mentioned, my name is Dr. George Ogallo. I am a member of the NACADA board. It's a great pleasure to be here. And first, let me say, I'll see you, the, all the partners and stakeholders that are here, uh, the NACADA staff. Um, it's, it's great that we are here this morning for this very important occasion. I think our being here first is uh, a demonstration of um, an acknowledgement of the problem that we are dealing with. Um, the alcohol and drug related problems are not issues of statistics. Uh, they are not numbers on paper. This is an issue that we are all having an experience around uh, in our families, in our communities, and we can see it in our nation in different ways. And in, in the, to a great extent, we, we share the suffering occasioned by the problem that we are dealing with. Uh, it's my great pleasure on behalf of the board chair to be able to be part of this launch and to represent her and the rest of the board. As the CEO has said, uh, we are being intentional, uh, extremely intentional about partnership, acknowledging that uh, the issue of drugs and alcohol abuse is so much entrenched in the society that actually a number of people have given up and they say, let's just live with it. Uh, we have taken it as one of those things uh, and said life happens and then we continue with other things. Uh, this issue of uh, this problem is um, very much a global problem. The UN addresses itself to the challenge and in the General Assembly session 2016 recommended uh, that promotion of the well-being of society as a whole through elaboration of effective scientific evidence-based uh, prevention strategies centered on and tailored to the needs of individuals, families, and communities as part of comprehensive and balanced national drug policies on an undiscriminatory basis uh, be part of it. Now, there is an appreciation that different stakeholders should be involved in the development of prevention programs aimed at raising public awareness of the dangers and risks associated with uh, drug abuse. And this stakeholding is limited to people who are involved in different spaces, including policymakers. There's need for law enforcement, and therefore the authorities around that. There's need for advocacy, and therefore calling on civil society to be part of it. There's need for individuals, even the ones that have recovered, to be part of it. The private sector indeed needs to be part of it. And we have other service providers for rehabilitation, we have teachers, we have people in the health prof profession. All of these people should be uh, part of it because in many ways, we experience the challenge that is occasioned by the drug and alcohol abuse problem. And therefore, uh, this is one of the singular issues that requires every sector. Um, it needs every hand on deck. Uh, by all of us as stakeholders. And I would say when as parents and brothers and sisters, 
who care and mean well for the society. And so as we launched this framework, allow me to even appreciate you further that you are seated here. Not that some of you are beginning, but actually you are continuing. And so our coming together and engaging in launching this framework is part of strengthening what is already going. So really, I really want to, on behalf of the board, to appreciate what you're already doing. In, um, in Kenya, as in the global situation, the danger of uh, drugs and alcohol abuse is, 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 is prevalent, and uh, it is, it's a danger to public health. Uh, the quality of life of many people is affected. I work in a space in the universities and colleges, um, and it is always sad to see uh, young people who are aspiring to be professionals in the university. And you can see the way they are moving, that uh, drugs and alcohol uh, pose a danger of curtailing that future, not just for themselves, but for what they represent, because they represent the workplace in the future, they represent families that will emerge, they represent really the, 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 the productivity of the country. And so when we talk about uh, some of the categories of our populace being affected, it begins too early and it poses a generational danger for, for that matter. Uh, so it has socioeconomic effects and, and harm to our young people and vulnerable populations. An individual susceptibility to this problem may be partly predicted by assessing the nature and number of their community, family, and individual level risk and protective factors. <clears throat> so um, uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, this framework we are launching today is uh, an inspiring initiative. The board has sat and looked at it, and it's one of those things that we give a stamp to, and as Professor said, this is um, a new dawn, and I hope it is a new dawn in our own way in which we are embracing it. Uh, this uh, has been formed by a technical working group comprising persons done from the groups that are already mentioned in collaboration with NACADA. And uh, so we launched it today to strengthen our commitment uh, in the fight against alcohol and drug abuse and other substances. So the goal of this framework, I need not to say again, is to help anchor prevention and management initiatives aimed at ensuring that we have a safe, a healthy, and a substance use free uh, community and nation uh, in this country. And the objectives have already been highlighted to us. Now, the benefits for this framework uh, are already articulated to reiterate uh, that we need to build synergy in this fight. And by all of us participating, then we will have a wider reach in our communities. Uh, sometimes I think when a problem is entrenched, we get used to it. It's like those days when I was young and we, we used to cook, you know, the three stones for those who know them. If you stay in the kitchen for too long, you get used to the smoke. Uh, only when you get out somewhere, people will smell that you actually, you have smoke. But for you, it's normal. I think uh, the drug uh, and substance issues are becoming uh, like that. And uh, for, for some of us, it could be that we feel overwhelmed in the light of the data and the reality we face. So I think it's encouraging that we are having a framework that's going to help us to build synergy and reach the wider community. Um, so we, we shouldn't feel overwhelmed and throw in the towel. And this is what the framework is providing for us, including to be able to share information and give advice and perspective, uh, even to NACADA, uh, because this is not an ACADA issue as we have already um, intim intimated. Uh, we need to continue fostering cooperation between our organizations, between among community members and diverse sectors of the society. So this framework offers um, not just an idea, but also practical ways. This has been highlighted, and as you go through it, you will notice that it gives us some practical steps uh, uh, to help us begin to engage. Because I think sometimes problems and issues can be so overwhelming that you wonder 
where do I begin from? And I think this framework provides something to hold on and become creative about. And we are grateful that that's happening. It provides us an idea on how we can form groups and how we can ensure that the community is as involved as possible. Uh, and so we, we are glad uh, about that. So let me uh, make my uh, uh, conclude by saying that uh, following this great achievement, uh, the work has just begun. Uh, you can tell the work has just begun because the problem is huge and visible. It's upon uh, us all who implement interventions in the community to work together for a common purpose and ensure the effective implementation of the framework. And so, on behalf of the board, but that's not the echo I'm talking about, but I do echo the call to action to uh, all relevant stakeholders, and you are here, and some are online, uh, and particularly community players, because we need to get down to where the, where the, not only the problem is, but where we see its effect, uh, consequences even more. And I can assure you on behalf of NACADA and the NACADA board uh, that we have a commitment to closely work with state and non-state actors for an alcohol and drug-free environment where children and youth can thrive. And I should add where all of us uh, can thrive because we are all uh, made in the image of God. We need to live lives of dignity from when you are young to the end of your life. So we have a commitment to this. So Nakada commits to this and we have included in the framework and, and from our commitments to build capacity as the CEO has said, uh, strengthening the ability and skills of groups and organization to be able to plan, to undertake and manage initiatives. So I want to once again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, much appreciation to the NACADA team and all other stakeholders that have been involved and been part of this framework. I know that together we can make a difference. I do pray that you will find this framework inspiring, useful to the commitments uh, so that we can be creative, committed, and create a safe, a healthy, a productive, and a sober nation. The Lord bless you and thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Director Dr. Bella. Now, before we launch, now the ones who are helping us Yes, kindly start preparing. Allow me to recognize the members or the partners who are online. We have the Rotet Community Initiative, Yolita Youth, Zawena Treatment Center, EMC Youth Empowerment Initiative, Lifetime Wellness Center, Smart Key CBO, Bomo Hospital, Reach of Political Parties, TRT Youth Development Association, Renaissance Treatment and Rehabilitation Center, Strengthening Community Partnerships and Employment, that is COPE, Tinada Youth Organization, Sobon Serenity Center, Anrid Kamude Counseling Services, SAGE in Kenya, and other. Kindly let's appreciate them with a the clap. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to invite our board director, our CEO, the two lady presidents in the room, and our manager, kindly come and join us as we launch the framework. Kariboni. And any of the partners who are near, you can come closer. Thank you. 
And one shot as people are saying very much. Now allow me to invite for the vote of thanks, Dr. Pamela Kaithuru, who is the president of ISAP Kenya, to give us the vote of thanks. Karibu Dr. Great. Good morning once again. Uh, great. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here as I sub Kenya. I have this great honor of appreciating every one of you for this uh, availability, for sacrificing your time to be part of this. Let me begin, first of all, with appreciating our CEO, Nakanda, uh, Mr. Victor. Okioma, thank you for ensuring that this is put in place. I want to also uh, appreciate our board member, uh, Dr. Ogola, who has given us a wonderful uh, picture of what we are supposed to do or what these documents helps us to be able to achieve as a nation. Thank you, Dr. Tari, for your kind ones. And we know that we, you will be part of implementation, especially reaching out to uh, the fraternity in the universities. I want to appreciate the management of Nakanda, all the directors present and the senior managers, Dr. Orlando and um, uh, Susan Maua and the rest. Thank you for the part you have put in ensuring that this document is achieved. When I look at the back, plenty of 
of a number of uh, Nakanda people were involved. And I believe uh, more than even this listed here, I've taken uh, put a lot to be able to have this framework formed. I want to appreciate the other stakeholders, Slam Child Foundation, Evangelical Alliance of Kenya, SAPTA, Non-Communicable Diseases Alliance of Kenya, Ministry of Education uh, here, the basic education, Blue Cross, Renaissance, Kanke, Skank, Kara, and of course, without forgetting our online community. And high up at last. Of course, I couldn't start with you because, <laughs> because I'll be being selfish. So, uh, honorably, I really uh, say thank you on behalf of Nakanda for being part of this framework, for evening, even honoring the invitation to be part of this launch, because this framework, as we have been told, puts our country on the map, puts us together for us to be able to actually standardize our interventions at the community level, taking the gospel where it is needed, taking the services and the community, because the damage that uh, substance use is causing to our country and threatening sustainable development of our country calls for everyone of us participation. Our, the implementation of this document is not limited to the people I have, uh, to the institutions that I have made a mention of here. You have a responsibility as those who are participating to recruit more of the institutions, more of the community to be able to be part of this. Because as the director pointed out, uh, I mean, the CEO pointed out, it's the responsibility of every Kenyan to ensure that we achieve for the better of our nation, for the better of our community. Therefore, with those uh, few remarks, I want to say that Kenya is privileged, Africa is privileged to have a community that is interested in response, especially for sustainable development. I take this opportunity to wish you a Merry Christmas, a prosperous and engaging year 2023, as well as say that the Lord bless you for your participating and then good God increase you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sari. So allow me to invite uh, Rosemary Appeal to give us the closing prayers, even as now we continue enjoying our tea. I know our boss and our board member have to rush elsewhere. So to Ombe Chukunye Chai to Kendelea Kujuana. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's unfortunate that I have a pastor, my pastor, in the room, and I don't feel free to pray when he's here. Kindly close the pressure, close the, the activity for us. He's my pastor in church. Amen. We will pray. Father, we thank you because indeed you are a good God. Thank you uh, for the journey that you have allowed us to even take together as different partners, not even as, as a team. I thank you for all the people who were able to make it for this meeting this particular morning. Thank you for the others that were invited but are not here. I pray that everything that you have brainstormed and deliberated on together, that each and every one of us will find space to do that which is required of us, O oh God, that we will see that godly success that we intend us to have. I thank you for the Nakada team and thank you for all the partners that are here. Bless us as you move, Lord, even to finish the last lap of the year. And we thank you, Lord, for an engaging 2023. Bless us all, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. Okay, thank you. So we are going to have one uh, group photo. Yeah. 
So if all of us can kindly come to the podium so that we have our group photo. Thank you. For the people online, Asante Nisana, you are free to log out. Thank you for joining us.